Welcome to Inside the Set with Set Decor. Inside the Set is a series that focuses on the design and decor of stories that excite us and ignite our imaginations. Where we get to discuss the collaborations between production designers and set decorators and hear firsthand accounts of how those works of art came to be from their inception to ideas on the page through completion, where we sit in the dark and experience them collectively. Welcome to another edition of the Set Decorator Society of America's Inside the Set. I'm Andrew Baseman, SDSA Set Decorator, and it is my honor to speak with the marvelous Mrs. Maisel Set Decorator, Ellen Christensen, SDSA, and production designer, Bill Groom. Together, Ellen and Bill have won two ADG awards and have been nominated for three Emmy Awards for the past seasons of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel for Prime Video. Congratulations to you both on another season of stunning work. Thank you for having us. Thank you, it's so nice to be invited. So how is working on season four different than working on the previous three seasons? And were most of the scripts written when you started prep? Uh, no, we don't get all of the scripts in advance. We get them pretty much one or two scripts ahead of our work. And there have been times when we've gone into production uh, basically with simply an outline and uh, proceeded from that point on. I, I think the pace has always been pretty brisk. And I don't think it's really very different this year. We do have a lot of established sets, but we did create another big set, as you'll see. So for me, the Wolford, um, the burlesque theater, Midge works at as an MC between acts is so impressive and it immediately became my favorite set of the season. I especially love all the dressing room and backstage details. And each time I watch an episode, I see more and more. How did you even begin to design and decorate an entire theater, including the front house, backstage, orchestra pit, mezzanine and boxes? That's a loaded question for you, Bill. It's like anything like this, you just take one step in front of the other. And um, I love the expression that walking makes the path. And that's kind of what you do, I think, with a show like this. And Ellen did all that amazing dressing in the um, uh, dressing room backstage. And um, that was always imagined to be a big part of the Wolford. Yeah, it truly is magnificent. Are there any pieces of set dressing that we haven't seen on camera yet that's hidden back there somewhere that hopefully we'll see one day? Well, there's a big camel, I, I think, in the second dressing room that I actually rented from Newell. Um, I don't know if we've seen the camel yet, but they did end up using a bathtub I had gotten. They wanted a, a bathtub scene, and I said, well, here's the bathtub. And they painted it pink, and we added some bubbles, and that was that. And then I got a big cage that I rented from Eclectic, and we ended up actually putting sparkly beads on the ribs of the cage and they ended up using that in the scene. So we sort of put things in and, and they discover them and sometimes they come out and they have their moment. Excellent. Well, speaking of which, I read about the My Fair Lady chandelier and it is truly gorgeous. Please tell me where you found such an iconic piece of movie history and how did you transport and hang it? I imagine the set dressers were a bit nervous with it. Well, it's the Warner Brothers. Um, spoke with Richard, who said, he sort of warned me, he said, Big Bertha has been sitting for a while in the back lot. And I said, that's okay. We love her, we want her. And she showed up and she needed a lot of work. Uh, but um, we got a professional chandelier restoration company and it looks, she, it looks so much better now. And, but yes, everyone was a little worried uh, with reason. <laughs> it traveled across the country in a carriage, so to speak, built for it. And it was a bit wider than eight feet. I think it turned a bit on its side in order to travel and uh, meet the highway requirements. Um, but, but as Ellen said, it needed a huge amount of work, uh, which could have been very discouraging, but uh, wasn't because we brought in this chandelier company and they, they really made it wonderful. And so Warner Brothers will be getting it back in much better shape than we got it. Well, it seems like it's appropriately named. Big Bertha sounds like one of the names of the strippers. So <laughs> there you go. Sure. So here's another question for you. Ethan's fake birthday party is a wonderful example of how you successfully layer an already detailed interior. How do you balance realism versus fantasy in terms of the candy colored sets and dressing? In an interview once, our costume designer, she referred to it as magic realism, which I think is probably 
pretty correct because we do use kind of heightened colors and as true as we can be to the period, but there's there's a point at which we push it just a little bit. Don't you think, Ellen? Yes, absolutely. Like, look at all those balloons everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and in a related question, do you look for dressing, fabrics, wallpaper, etc., with colors that will appear as is or the colors heightened in post-production? I think they're as is. I don't know that anything is done afterwards. We, we really don't do much in post in terms of the color palette. We do other things in post, but um, mm -hmm. because it's a period show and that's kind of a necessary part of a period show. And same with costumes, they're just fabulous, just the way they are. Well, I'm always surprised and delighted how the colors are so coordinated, even with the lipstick, like every detail is just like out of a magazine. How closely do you work with the cinematographer? Are you asked to provide specific lighting for each set? We work very closely with David. He's, he's great, and he's responsible for a lot of the look of the show, uh, I feel. He, it, it's interesting, in the first season, an interviewer asked him about the look of the show, and he said, I wanted to give the show an optimistic look, which I think was a great word to use. Um, so it, it has that feeling that was there in the late 50s, uh, this sense of optimism for the future. World War II was behind us and uh, we were looking forward to the, the atomic age and, and uh, all the miracles that was gonna bring. And I think he brought that optimism uh, into the photographic look of the show. And it's interesting that you mentioned that things are so well co coordinated. We really only did the typical meetings and boards of sketches and, and research and all that in the uh, pilot episode. And then after that, we just got busy working. And um, Donna Zakowska and I joke that we coordinate things by not talking. We'll often not talk about a particular set, especially, I mean, maybe just very, uh, in, in a very basic kind of way. And then she shows up and everything is so perfectly coordinated with the colors and the set and all of that. And uh, so we, it, it kind of works, so we don't want to mess that up. We just kind of keep working that way. Andy, I don't know if you remember the tea room, but all the women showed up with these hats, and it was so perfect. The whole thing together, everyone just sort of stood there and went, wow, amazing. I remember the old tea. There were a few tea rooms left in New York City when I first arrived in the 70s. And it... Um, really kind of captured that. And Donna and I managed to make that happen without talking very much. I noticed that in Susie's office, for example, there's um, red chairs that come in later as, as it's being decorated. And um, Midge is wearing red accessories as well. So those seems like another example of how you and the costume designer don't talk, but it seems to work out perfectly. And I've said before to interviewers, you know, it's not like it's scripted that this this set will be pink and that set will be this and this set will be bright and this it, it's never scripted that way but somehow the feelings of the sets and, and the wardrobe for that matter are just present in the writing because they're such good great writers um i mentioned once that i was in a little panel with tony shalhoub and and that question came up about coordinating things and he said, it's coordination by shared sensibilities. And I think that's probably true of the acting too. I think it's just, uh, it's an ensemble in, in a very large way, including all of us. And you kind of go on instinct in a way. And, and Susie's an example of an old office that had been around forever and had been abandoned. And um, it just is what we went with. And, you know, her furniture was supposed to have fallen off a truck from her friends there. So it was part of that, just something that they would bring in, which is a little more masculine. And I thought, well, she would have plaid because there's nothing about Susie that has anything to do with flowers or candy colors. So it's a little subdued in that way. I would also like to point out, you've talked about um, things that get incorporated into the writing. This air shaft at Susie's office is an example of that. I felt like we couldn't just have windows on one side of the room uh, for lighting and that the air shaft was important. I also felt like 
that we could see life going on in that air shaft. And I pitched that to Amy and Dan and they were like, yeah, maybe that, that sounds interesting. And then they started using it and developed a whole character uh, works across the way and shares her phone with Susan. So uh, the set kind of became uh, a motivation for a character in action for the character. And whose idea was to bring the pigeons in? Because I love those. That I have to say was my idea because of, I've scouted so many empty, vacant locations over the years, um, many with windows that are slightly open and so many locations, um, vacant locations I've been to have had pigeons roosting inside because they'll go wherever they can. And I mentioned that to Amy and Dan and they loved it and they wrote the pigeons into the show and they've become um, sort of pets of Susie's. And did she name them? I don't know that they have names. <laughs> There's still time for that. Yeah. New York City is an important character in the show. Are you able to recreate 1960 New York within the five boroughs? Or did you have to leave the city for locations that more closely resemble New York City from 60 plus years ago? We pretty much stay in the five boroughs. It's, it's tough. And it's especially tough because Amy, our showrunner, loves to shoot 360 degree angles. She loves to get in the middle of a room and spin or in a street and spin. And that's very hard on a period project. You, you know, generally you kind of need to know where the limits to the frame are. And we've, we just, after the first season of the pilot, really, we figured out that that was never going to work. So everywhere we go, we look to see what's, what the problems are in every direction. And, and Amy, works with us on that. If there's a great location and we can't see in a per particular direction, she wants to know and she takes that into consideration, but she loves to see everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ellen, I love musical theater references throughout the series and it was fun to catch posters from Fiorello and the Village Voice bullpen and the unsinkable Molly Brown outside of Susie's office window. Are these specific references in the scripts or things you found on your own? Um, that comes from our graphic department, our wonderful graphic department. I don't know that they were specifically mentioned, but it sometimes it says musical show posters. But I think a lot of that just I sit with them and it's like, well, we need something here. <clears throat> this is the character. And then they again, like Bill says, they it just they know what it what it should be. And it comes together and I get it and I'm standing there and I go, oh, isn't this great? And it goes in and it's perfect. Our graphic artists are the ones who work uh, the most closely with our clearance department. So they have to figure out what what's allowed to, we're allowed to use and what we're not allowed to use. So um, they come up with a lot of those things. One thing I would like to say we haven't touched on is um, there was just an image of the Village Voice. And it reminded me how when you have a, a series that goes through so many seasons, the places evolve. You know, it's Kennedy election time. Lots of bumper stickers, you know, it's Kennedy. And then the next time we were there, the election was over. So it's like, okay, that goes away. And what goes on top of it and, and making sure that it's not just locked in, like the same coat and the same coat hook every time. It's spring, it's summer. They had a late edition. They had pizza. They had deli sandwiches. So it just has to be alive and change like a real place does. And that's part of, of making it real. There was a lot of research that really was helpful with the floor pattern, all the file cabinets overflowing, the kinds of typewriters they had. And so it was really, it's really nice to have a real concrete reference to say, oh, let's do this, let's do this. And, and it, you know, it, it, again, it just helps make it feel like they're really there. Well, and it helps the actors too. I mean, our actors have talked about that, how helpful it is that the drawers are dressed and there's a built backing outside a door they have to walk in, something that uh, gives them some chance to get into um, their character before they walk onto the set in front of the camera. Um, everything we do, in my opinion, is for the character and the story. And a lot of what we do is for, not just for the director, but for the actors as well. This set came back from season one, it went away. Now it's back for season four. Um, 
So it was kind of new for season four in a way. And it's in the same building as Abe and Rose's apartment was in. And these both uh, were based on real apartments, which we shot at that location in season one because we weren't building big sets like this in uh, the pilot. At the beginning of season four, Amy went into Midge's dining room and said, it needs to be different. So we did do new chairs with pink upholstery, these little buttons. We had a new Parsons table, some new furniture to the side. There was a piano now for Abe. The kitchen was kind of intact from the location, but I changed all of the colors and the hardware and things like that. But we tried to keep it in the feeling of Midge's original apartment because this is an apartment she gets back from um, her father-in-law. But it's interesting that recently I had a conversation with a director friend of mine and he asked about this job and I said, it's just challenging how big it gets each season. And it, it was interesting. He said, well, but it has to because this is a show about more. He said, this is a show about a woman who kind of accidentally becomes a comedian and then has success, even though when she takes this apartment, she's kind of fallen on hard times. She's, her taste has grown a bit as she's grown as a performer. Ellen, when they, when they go to storage and see all the pieces that they're bringing back, there's the lamp. I think they call it the orgy lamp. Did you find that or did you make that? Or what it seems like a key piece of dressing? Heather Lawford did the uh, pilot and those, she found those lamps somewhere. And as far as I know, they weren't called the orgy lamp until they decided to use that in, in, in that episode in, in season four. I think the writers looked at the set or looked at some footage and said, oh, what, what's with that lamp? And actually Dan came to me and he said, what would you call what's happening in that lamp? And I said, well, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of activity. And um, so they decided it was the orgy lamp. Well, it's taken on a life of its own. It has. And it will be for sale when the show's over. Um, <laughs> It'll do very well on eBay, I'm sure. Yes. Do you ever stumble upon amazing or unique items that you were not even looking for and then ask the showrunner, writer, or director to write them into the script? So we'll probably say the same thing. We actually um, found the beauty salon. Uh, that we use in the Catskills uh, at an old department store that my assistant Mary Fellows had found and taken us to and bought a lot of dressing. And then we walked in, we weren't even looking for it, and there was this intact beauty salon with pink chairs and everything perfect. And Bill mentioned it to Amy and Dan, and, and they said, sure. So we ended up using it. More than once. Yeah. You really use incredible details throughout, and I especially enjoyed seeing the scotch cooler in the strip club orchestra pit, which I remember from my grandmother's house growing up. <laughs> I would imagine that many of the viewers look forward to watching the series just to spot other nostalgic items from their past. Have you dressed in any set dressing using your own personal or family history? And do any of the actors or crew members ask you to feature any specific items from their past? None of the actors have um, or crew members for anything. People are always saying, oh, my grandmother's house is, you know, being cleared out. There's a stove, there's a this. So sometimes we do act on that and see what it is. And I, I don't know if this came through somebody in your department, Ellen, or where it came from, but somebody told us there was a 1960s kitchen being demolished or, or completely um, emptied out somewhere in, maybe it was Connecticut, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's Moish and Shirley's kitchen. So all of those cabinets, the appliances, everything were being removed from a kitchen for a renovation. And somebody heard about it, told us, and we bought it and brought it in and installed it. And that entire kitchen is from the period and, and our real cabinets from that period. Wow. Yes, Carolyn Cartwright, another set decorator, had email me, she said, a friend of mine who's an architect is renovating a house and there's this kitchen. And I said, great, let's go see it. And everyone went and all the carpenters went and you know, measured and the set dressers and we just lifted it and brought it over. And we pretty much designed that kitchen, the window openings and all of that to fit the cabinets. 
Do you have a favorite set or an item of set dressing from the entire season? It's hard to say favorite because some of the quicker ones, like the tea room, are just so wonderful. But I really enjoyed doing Moish and Shirley's house because it had to be comfortable and really believable. Shirley's a little bit of an outside character. So she has a little bit of a flair, but not not necessarily a tasteful flair like Rose. She has her fancy living room that probably she didn't use to let anybody into. And um, now all the kids are there. And she's just happy and welcoming. And I thought the house should be comfortable, still colorful, but a little more subdued. And that that's an example. I mean, Ellen would, would bring things in, and it was just perfectly Shirley. Ellen works pretty much constantly thinking of Shirley's taste and that shows in the, um, in the finished set, I think. It's interesting to note, by the way, that we established this set in season three and it was a location in Forest Hills, which they wrote into the characters that that's where they were moving. But that what you're looking at at the moment is actually on stage. And we built uh, a yard, a sidewalk walking up to it, a street, cars and a backing with the buildings that are across the street in Forest Hills. We had to do that because of COVID. We weren't going to be able to park our trucks in uh, Forest Hills and weren't even sure that we could shoot in that location when we started the season. So we reproduced that house on stage in all of its detail and uh, it matches pretty well. It's amazing. People walk in who have been to the location and they're a little bit like, freaked out. Like, I can't believe that this is exactly the same. Yeah, you fooled me. It really seems seamless. So congrats on that. That the company did the backdrop. It was Roscoe there just did a beautiful job. It's when you're standing in the middle of the set, you can almost believe you're on the street. It's so realistic. And it's huge. It's about 120 feet long and uh, 30 feet high. I think my favorite set of the season was actually established in season three, and that's Joel's Club. And that was based on um, an old abandoned location I had seen in Queens. And it was a meeting room of the Queens Democratic Society upstairs. It had that tiny bar. I copied a lot of it, but then of course we had to change it because it wasn't a nightclub like this. It didn't have a stage, but I, I based the design on that space and uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the way that turned out and the way it's used in the show. Is that the set and maybe his office that has the painted chair rail over the molding? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. love that detail. It's very Bill Groom. <laughs> so tied into the button club is the Chinatown street and gift shop. As usual, you've had done yourselves in the level of detail. Was this done on location in Chinatown? And how much advance time did you have to prepare, shop, dress uh, for this vast and impressive location? It was Ellen who brought it. That was an interior we did on stage. And she brought in all of the cabinetry, thousands of items uh, that you, we tried to do it on location because I thought it was going to be difficult to fill a, a Chinese gift shop, but Ellen managed to do it. And with some items, I would say, Ellen, that are priceless and some items that were just cheap Chinatown souvenirs. Yes, I actually found um, from a vendor up in Hudson, he had just cleared out an entire old country store. So we bought all the cabinets and then we just had to fill it. But um, it was always a lot of fun and yeah, it took a lot of detail. Some really old, great looking horses and then some just little bits of nothing teacups. I, I would like to point out that Ellen minimizes that by saying, we just had to fill it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did it beautifully. And I like the, the signs, um, the price tags and the, the signs um, that tied it all together nicely. Um, in episode three, Midge's Tupperware party was another pastel colored visual treat, complete with flower arrangements and coordinating colors. I can just imagine many of the viewers saying, my mother had that green colander. Uh, where did you find so many vintage products in such excellent condition? Are there Tupperware museums or collectors you rented from? Well, Carrie Lederman was working with me at the time and she connected with someone who collects Tupperware, one of the 
bigger collectors of Tupperware, I'd say, and, and she rented us an entire collection. The props, of course, as well. A lot of similar items that people are actually touching and dealing with, but we had a lot of that huge display on the table <clears throat> was from this one collector. Mm-hmm. And she was so excited to be part of the show and really nice and, and wonderful. And who made the hats? Oh, I don't know if it was Crosser Coffins, but then we did, Ward- you know. Christopher might have been Wardrobe. Yeah, Wardrobe. But Christopher Bassett does all the flowers for the show. And again, I just showed him, there's the Tupperware, you know, make something wonderful. And, and he always does. So tell us what um, some of the more challenging locations were to shoot in during COVID. Well, the locations that, that required um, a lot of presence on the street were probably the most difficult. This is why we ended up building the Wilford, um, because we were not going to be allowed to park our trucks on the street in front of any Broadway theater, even though the Broadway theaters were dark at that point. Um, And so it just wasn't a possibility to use an existing Broadway theater. The ballroom at the Plaza Hotel that we used for the wedding is an example where we probably would not have been able to use that location had it not been for COVID because the plaza, um, they were not booking that room during COVID. It's normally a very difficult place to get to for a movie because of the cost, but also the availability. And both of, both of those things were made it possible for us to do it during COVID. One fun thing about shooting in locations, even at the plaza, is that the locations people always come up to me and say, well, they like to keep this, and they like to keep that. (laughs) Can they have the furniture and the curtains? And I think, well, that's a nice compliment that they feel it belongs here, you know. I hope you gave them the flowers, at least, unless they were silk. On the tables, they were all fresh. It was just the big, giant ones Mm -hmm. um, were silk and, and fresh. Yeah, they were beautiful. Yeah. I'd like to point out that the Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Hall is another location that we would not have been able to use had it not been for COVID. I worked there many years ago, and we had three hours from the time we entered to light it, dress the sets, rehearse, and get ready for the concert. That was not the case for us because of COVID. We were able to have that location for, how, how long was it, Ellen? Three days we were there, maybe? Three days. And they just reupholstered all the chairs and refurbished everything. It was just like glowing. Yeah. <laughs> and were there COVID restrictions about how many extras, extras you could have in the audience? Because in the scene, of course, it's, it's packed. Well, that's all visual effects, pretty much. I mean, there we had maybe, what do you think, Ellen? 125 people there? Probably. And... Um, Leslie Robson Foster, our brilliant visual effects coordinator, uh, tiled everything. So she just kept moving people around and shooting it and put it all together. And then, Ellen, there are so many sets that have dozens and dozens of matching chairs. This is for all the set decorators out there. Do you just buy sets of chairs when you see them, knowing you'll use them eventually? Sometimes, but I have to tell you that at this point, I have people reaching out to me all the time. Oh, I have 100 chairs. You want them? And um, people know that we're always looking for chairs. There, there have been some sets in Las Vegas showrooms. I, I think we had like 300 chairs, all the same. And that's pretty challenging. You know, it's the multiples. You can always really find one great thing. But when you get into like 50 and 100 um, and then upholstering them, you know, at the time. But I would say, yes, we, we uh, were always looking for chairs. <laughs> And we bought the chairs for the Wolford at a catering place. They they had some old chairs out back that had been covered in tarps for decades, I think. I don't know. They'd never thrown them away. Ellen approached them, asked them. They're perfect. They have black frames with the right amount of wear, pink uh, vinyl upholstery. And for the the price of $3 each. I noticed the wear on the chairs and also the, the mirrored chip, the chip pieces of mirror on the round tables. And I wondered if they came like that or if you added or enhanced the, the aging. We made the tables, yeah. And with the linoleum on the top and the mirrored edge. We used a lot of marmoleum. 
from Carpet Time. I love Marmoleum. I think it's so beautiful. All the patterns and the richness of the colors. Uh, it's really a fabulous material. We use it on bar tops all the time, platforms. Yeah, it's great stuff. Well, my last question was that I'm looking forward to season five, as are all the fans of the show. Can you, can you divulge in any upcoming sets that we can look forward to seeing? No. That's what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> but you're going to love them. <laughs> I'm sure I am. Well, Ellen and Bill, it was really great talking to you both. Congratulations again on another successful season. And we look, all look forward to seeing what you come up with for season five. Thank you so much. We're loving uh, season five, and uh, we don't know how it's going to end, but we're looking forward to knowing. I would tell you if we knew. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This is an honor to be invited. Thanks to the SDSA. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Inside the Set with Set Decor. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website, setdecor.com. 